as Franz just said, we're going to be talking about uh, the broad topic of the future of business. Uh, we're going to leave some time for questions at the end. Uh, so obviously it is such a broad topic. If you have any follow-on questions to things we talk about over the first 45 minutes, you can ask those. If you want to introduce something new, feel free. That's the time to do it. Um, and when, for me, the future of business and the description uh, on the anti-convention website, uh, it talks about uh, the pandemic as a factor in wanting to have this conversation because of um, well, all the realities it created in the short and long term, uh, interruption in the supply chain, interruption in business, um, uh, the inability to do business in your actual brick and mortar uh, location and other things. Um, I, I feel like, and I'd like to explore this a little, uh, that certain things that were already happening were probably accelerated uh, by the pandemic, um, but we'll get into all that in a minute. I'd like to just start, because they will do it better than I will. If we could just go down the line here, I'm just going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and just uh, orient all of you with just a, a couple of lines about what they do. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Matt Jamie. I am the founder of Bourbon Barrel Foods. We are located in Louisville, Kentucky, and we are a maker of specialty food products that represent you know, the rich history and heritage that Kentucky has with making bourbon. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rich Rosendell. Uh, in 2013, I left the Greenbrier. I was the executive chef and director of food and beverage at the, at the hotel and oversaw 18 kitchens there. Uh, but I wanted to start something that was exciting to me, uh, and I launched Rosendell Collective. Uh, I know this sounds like a lot of layers, but it is what I do. Um, and uh, the way that the company is set up, I wanted to create something that gave me lots of different outlets to be able to be creative, to be able to uh, create brands. So we have uh, basically Rosendell Collective is the uh, holding company, and then under that is a multitude of different uh, LLCs. We have Rich's Backyard, we have uh, on Amazon Spices, we have the RC Culinary Lab, which is a commissary kitchen, uh, we have two restaurants, Roots 657, uh, we have a boutique culinary school, and Rosendell Online. Um, but uh, they're all kind of separate uh, entities operating under the holding company Rosendell Collective. Hi, I'm Maeve Rochford. Uh, I I'm the owner and executive chef of Sugar and Scribe in La Jolla, and I would say that I'm very similar to him in that I'm layers, but I am in one location, and so there is Sugar and Scribe, but within Sugar and Scribe is a 160-seat brunch restaurant, then within within Sugar and Scribe is an actual bakery, and then there's an actual patisserie, we also are a cakery, and an actual coffee shop and it's all in one place. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Chef Rhys Sims. I'm the pioneer of legal home-based restaurant in San Diego. Um, however, we not just stop in San Diego, we are now become the ambassador to make it legal to another city and county in California. And we're gonna move along to um, LA, also Santa Cruz, and another one will be San Mateo, because not much uh, legal home-based uh, restaurant in California yet. And another one that we just did, uh, we're gonna make the uh, Utah as well, already approved for a home-based restaurant. And in San Diego, I'm the only one authentic Indonesian restaurant in San Diego. We ship traditional Indonesian rice house uh, in the container, dismantle over there, and bring it over here. So, yeah. I'm Chef Steve Brown of Swagoo. Uh, we have Swagoo, the Swagoo brand has many, many layers. We have Swagoo Chop Shop, which is our nationwide butcher shop, all things Wagyu. We have Swagoo Burger. We have Swagoo Study Hall, which is our 12 course tasting menu of all Wagyu beef. And then we have um, Swagyu Jerky, which is the first and only A5 Japanese Wagyu Jerky. And then we also have a Swagyu Wildlife Ranch, which is, it's a ranch that we're building right now with Airbnbs and all live cooking and we're raising everything on the property. Thank you very much everybody for that. Um, I'm actually gonna start 
Uh, and apologies for people who read the question and, and the answer um, on the uh, WUVA app, but I, I thought it was a good one to start with because it's something that's been so in the news for the last few months and subject of a lot of conversations certainly that I've been a part of, and that is the question of what kind of a role AI is going to be playing um, in the future of the food business. Um, you know, that could apply obviously to R&D, that could apply to actual operations, um, almost any facet of the industry. Um, and Rich, you, you, I thought, answered really well uh, on the app. Could you maybe just either recap or just sure. however you want to answer it today? Um, yeah, I mean, with AI, I think I'll probably point to maybe just a, a few quick examples for all of you as far as why it'd be relevant. But I think leading with that, most importantly, is AI right now is one of the most important uh, technologies, and it's going to have a profound impact uh, on everything that you do. Um, uh, two ways that we use it. Um, one way is uh, I literally have, I kind of think of it as having like a team of, uh, of AI bots that are in various roles. One of the most effective ways that you can use it is uh, inputting to each one, instead of like saying you're going to create a, uh, you want a social media post or whatever, that's the easy stuff, or proofreading uh, an essay. You literally can assign to each chat or each bot uh, a, uh, give them a role or an objective and use that, continue to come back to it. Um, it's important that you confirm with, uh, with the chat bot uh, that they understand what the objective is. But these are learning language platforms and the more that you communicate uh, with each one of those streams of the conversation, they're going to learn more about the subject matter. We just had a power outage. Uh, the first thing I did is I went back and uh, the, the chat line that I have that is responsible for, I created one for safety to write a pandemic, a plan for a pandemic, one for fire safety. Um, those, that's one of the big ones. Another one, you're going to see it in video. You're going to see it in imagery. There's already apps and technology out there that you can literally assign the type of lens and the type of camera. And those inputs are going to determine the type of photography image that is created. Uh, so right now we're just scratching the surface. Uh, and then one other last quick one is we uh, this year did a partnership with Segway Robotics and uh, launched a service bot out into the dining room and it was super effective. So expect it, plan on it. It is going to integrate into all aspects of everything that you do. I want to second that. Uh, me as an immigrant, AI really, really, truly helped me to say at least something that I can put it on social media. It's just because, again, I'm a home-based restaurant. So I do everything myself. I don't have any um, staff. Yes, I have. Uh, California on, only allow you have one staff outside of your home. So basically, my husband and I we work together. But I handle everything. And as an immigrant, grammar is hard. And then my husband always not angry, but in a way like, can you please learn your English? But with AI, <laughs> it's really help. <laughs> so I second Jeffries. Thank you. Um, I'd love to just ask you two or anyone else who maybe can, uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but just, you know, I feel like there are people who have crossed the Rubicon on AI, they're educating themselves, they're learning how to use it, and then there are everyone else who's just completely intimidated, doesn't know where to start, is just kind of pretending it's not happening, um, like just doesn't, to their knowledge, maybe, they, maybe they're using it in ways they don't realize, right, like with certain software, but they're just like, they're afraid to jump in the pool, right? The water's too cold. They're, they don't want to jump in. Can, can either of you or anyone on the panel offer some advice on how you can give yourself a crash course or uh, make it easy for yourself to just start using the technology? For me, I'm using, I, you know, I'm using chat GPT. <laughs> you can just type whatever you want over there, even like, hey, how to do the recipe from, you know, Indonesia. They will, the AI will literally integrate every single thing. And then for the social media, hey, I want to make it casual fun for my viewers or my followers about uh, the dinner I'm going to do next week or even the event of Chevrolet. When you start in the AI chat GPT, it will help you a lot. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Did you? Um, I think like for me, um, I 
come from mainly sports my entire life. And so, uh, and I was really blessed being on like the junior Olympic team. And so I had very interesting coaching on like how we think and how we react to negative information, how we react to changes. And one of the best things that I've taken from sports is um, you want to be always a great leader on your team, but it's okay to not be the best on your team. And so I actually don't think I'm the best line chef at my restaurant. I am not the best macaron maker at my restaurant. And I'm most definitely not the most technical person at my restaurant. However, that gives me the ability to find the people that are the best. And so by finding people that are better than me, because I'm a great leader, I can lead them all and they can all be the best so they can shine within the company and not have the one person who, you know, there's no way Jeff Bezos does everything, but you talk about Jeff the most, you know? So like, I don't need people to talk about me, but I love hearing that people talk about Sugar and Scribe. So although I know AI is coming and I am very people driven and I wouldn't want a robot delivering my food, how can I have part of both? Like, how can we have that efficiency and that, that money savings, but also how can I keep everyone that is out there that loves this industry, how can I find the best of you and keep you? And not lose the human touch with your customers. Yeah, I yeah. think especially, um, I heard someone once say, oh, but, you know, anyone can, you know, bring you eggs and clean your table. And I can appreciate that on a certain level, absolutely. But I can also guarantee you that there's no robot that can have somebody that you have served eggs to for 12 years lose their wife and come in the first day without a wife. And the reason he came was because he is comfortable with you and he knows it's a safe place. That may be a dish that I'll never forget. And so... AI will replace certain things. It will make us better in certain things. But it doesn't mean that it has to take away the humanity part of what we do. Yeah. Thank I, you. So I completely agree with you on, on all of that. But we have, so we have a bunch of burger restaurants in those like ghost cloud kitchen type places, right? Where, where there's, we have front counter service places like, um, like at a food hall. But at these, at these, these big huge ghost kitchens where there's like 35 of them in the back only eight of them have counters and so it's again it's another husband wife combo doing their dream doing their cuisine because it's an easy for you to get into the cloud kitchens type thing right um it's a very good entryway but some of them are from here to outside outside of those doors that's how far their kitchen is to where the food needs to go so this is where the robots play in 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 helping them is they, the order comes through onto your POS system, the robot comes all the way to your kitchen, waits there, you put the food on there and you push go and it goes all the way back and then the attendant picks it up, puts it into the locker for people to pick up for like Uber Eats and, this, and all these kind of things. So there's a lot of ways that it does help for people that might not have the resources to be able to afford these employees to run or, or go here or there. And I know it's controversial, but, you know, chain fast foods going up to $20, you know, an hour in April, which is very expensive. If anyone runs restaurants, you know how, how small our margins can be, you know, so just Last saying. point on this topic, Rich. Um, mm-hmm. I, I actually think that it's like, as a business owner, it's, it's almost like your responsibility to um, not necessarily embrace every technology that comes along, but you want to learn about it. Because for me, the goal is to adapt a tool that I can be able to offer more higher paying premium wages. And if a component of that ends up being um, a service bot or chat GPT, uh, any of those items, if it's going to help me get to that point, um, then I'm going to be, I'm going to be open to it. Um, That's, that's, I think, part, part of the conversation. Uh, okay, I'd like to please, uh, and not just because he hasn't said anything yet, go to Matt. Please don't make, make me talk about AI. Um, oh, dear God, you're going to make me I'm talk not gonna about AI. I'm not going to make you AI. talk. No, this is not the AI panel. Okay. You're good. You're good. That was the end of the AI, if I have anything to say about it. Um, 
So, uh, Matt, you know, I spent some time uh, reading up on, on your company. Um, I spent a lot, some time, a lot of time on your website. Um, you know, you start off uh, producing soy sauce. That was your first thing. And you actually use this term, or whoever wrote the site uses this term explicitly, it grew into a lifestyle brand. Um, I'd like to know, A, whether that was an organic thing that just happened out of enthusiasm and passion, whether it was something, uh, whether there was a, a, a need that you perceived to diversify, um, and if you think we're going to be seeing more and more brands in the future, um, finding uh, other ways to express themselves across different products and across um, different ways of doing business, whether in person or virtually or that kind of thing. Well, this is one I can handle. Okay. Um, so I'm based in Louisville, Kentucky. It's the gateway to bourbon country. Uh, I started my company in 2006, um, microbrewing soy sauce. I saw an opportunity to do some things that nobody else was doing in the, in the marketplace, which was utilizing the barrel and uh, grabbing pieces that were you know, being used to bed horse stalls at Churchill Downs to put in a smoker and smoke spices, grew it into a brand from you know, one product to we have over 150 products now. Um, everything I've done has been uh, intentional. I saw the lifestyle component uh, available to me. Uh, bourbon, you know, everyone here is familiar with bourbon, you know where Kentucky is. Um, bourbon wasn't always embraced by the state of Kentucky, and it wasn't always as popular as it is right now. You know, a few years before we started, it was uh, at a low point. And I kind of saw the popularity growing, took advantage of that opportunity. Um, there wasn't anybody doing what I was doing at that time. All the distilleries looked the same. Um, you know, Heaven Hill would look like Woodford Reserve. Woodford Reserve might look like Wild Turkey. They had all the same products on the shelves. Um, so I changed that. And in doing so, saw an opportunity also to become a lifestyle brand. People come and visit us now. Uh, it is a huge tourist destination. Um, you know, people want to visit the distilleries because they've differentiated themselves. And so they want to bring a piece of that Kentucky lifestyle back with them, and so we give them that. You know, um, the barrels are like pigs. We use every last bit of them. We age in them, we smoke with them, I make furniture out of them. Um, and you don't sell the furniture though. Yeah, I used to. I find, you know, that I work with a guy that does, so. Great, and do you think this is, I mean, do you think we're gonna be seeing more and more of this? Do you, or do you, I mean, there's always been, we've. The term lifestyle brands existed for a long time. We've seen people do that with Napa. Right. For example, years right. ago, Mike Chiarello in, in California had the whole Napa style thing. Yes. Uh, I mean, we've seen it. But and you, he's a, I love him. Do you I think mean, there's going to? Yeah. Do you think there's going to? Do you think we're going to be seeing more of this? Do you think it's? Yeah. I mean, I would imagine you. I don't want to put words in your mouth. You sleep better at night having 150 products than you did having one. If I stop launching products, I become very uninteresting to my customers. And, you know, bourbon lends itself. You know, I don't put bourbon in everything. I mean, I think that's been done before. But um, we do try and take things from within the state that I think make the state of Kentucky special. Um, you know, all the fruit that we use for our, our jams and jellies. I only buy from within the state of Kentucky. The easiest thing to do would be to buy from someplace cheaper, which is south of here. And I don't want to do that. I don't ever do the easy thing. Um, I want to support people back home uh, as much as I possibly can, keep adding value to the agriculture that's there. Um, as far as this becoming something in other places, I don't see why it shouldn't be. You know, I, Of course it's going to happen again. I mean, it's just I was fortunate enough to be in a position in, uh, where I'm from where no one was doing it, you know? And I just kind of took the lead on it, and I'm not the only one, um, but because I was early on in it, I'm, I've been able to take that role on. I've sure. embraced it. Great, thank you. Um, for Re and Steve to start, please. Um, you know, again, this is, this is something, I, this is one of the things I meant when I said I feel like this was happening before the pandemic and maybe the pandemic accelerated and that is non-traditional 
restaurant, well, non-traditional restaurants, right? Restaurants in, in a home setting, supper club, uh, which you started doing. Um, uh, we have a thing where I'm in New York. There's a, there's a company called Resident that borrows um, uh, either a show unit or a vacant unit in luxury high-rises and has up-and-coming sous chefs come in and do tasting menus, right? So you can, buy, you can see kind of up-and-coming talent, have a tasting menu. It's in an unusual setting. Um, COVID, they actually thrived because they were able to stage these dinners, you know, on these beautiful patios or rooftops or, you know, in different buildings. Um, Pop-ups, obviously, that was already happening before. A lot of people who left the industry, left the brick-and-mortar restaurant industry during COVID, they stayed in the pop-up world, right? They, they've become, that's become a thing. I feel like it's already, the future, I feel like, in this front is here. Um, but I'd love to just hear the thoughts you two have about, um, you know, as people who've done it or are doing it, as people who I'm assuming must have talked to other people who do it, and, you know, maybe things on this front catch your eye as you follow industry news and whatnot. Uh, is my perception accurate? Is this yes. something that's c- going to just keep snowballing over the next several years? Go ahead. So, the premises of MICO, uh, MICO stands for Micro Enterprise Home Kitchen Operation. So, basically, you are allowed to have a legal small restaurant. It's a stepping stone for people who want to test their market. Um, and then... The idea of it from Governor Jerry Brown 2016 is just literally to tell, you know, a lot of home staff to making, you know, income for them. And San Diego is very conservative. It was so hard to get the license and everything. When we get our traditional rice house that we ship from Bali to here, original idea is actually for my husband a man cave. It's not even thinking about going to become a restaurant. We used to have a catering business before, but then, you know, he had the idea, okay, let's make a restaurant. And then we saw on the county health uh, website that there will be, you know, it's already implemented. However, it's not. So I told my husband, well, we cannot just stop that because the roof of the house, it was like super big, you know, <laughs> everybody can see it, you know. So, between him and I, especially my husband, he called every single supervisor in San Diego to make it approved. Finally, he get approved. This is why we become the pioneer. And then within that, um, we keep fighting for it. Uh, last June, the premises uh, start from you only can serve for 36 people in a week. Now we got it for 90 people in a week. Start from 50K cap that you can have per year, now we got it 100K per year. And then we have so many famous chefs that come to my restaurant, Warung Riri, in here. And then they even say, this is a dream life of a chef. Because I only can sit, I only have one table in Warung Riri. It's only minimum of two people and maximum of six people. And then some chefs were saying like, every single chef, they invite all their friends, come, not more than 10 people. The difference is I get paid, you know, but with this movement that we do right now, like I say, we already make Utah approved and then um, next October we're going to make uh, LA approved. Uh, we're in progress to make San Mateo and Santa Cruz approved. We're going to bring it to nationwide so we can help any other local home chef to have this. That's why it's going to be a good thing for, I think, you know, because what I really have is on community. I can proudly say that. Uh, a lot of immigrants, especially in San Diego, a lot of immigrants trying to uh, make a business, make, earn something for, you know, single parents, single mom. A lot of in San Diego, all the Miko, they are mostly just to go boxes from the apartment. I mean, they do it everything licensely. Like, you literally have to have your chef, uh, serve, serve, uh, chef, um, certificate and then all the food handlers and everything. But again, I my hope and my my dream is at least I can do something from everybody else, including my community. So I think it will be keep coming. Yeah. 
Sorry, Steve, just before you jump in, Ree, I'm just curious, uh, you know, you used the word pioneer before when you were introducing yourself. Yeah. Okay. As, as someone who sees themselves in that role, do a lot of people who are interested in doing this kind of thing come to you for advice, consultation? Oh, yeah. yeah, a lot. Actually, now, Warung Riri is not just serving Indonesian food, to be perfectly honest. We are having Warung Riri consulting business. <laughs> it's just because people came, you know, people came. I have so many email. Uh, last year, I spoke in San Diego County uh, food system. I talked to in front of 400 people, and then everybody started texting me. And even earlier today when I'm serving the lunch, the map, um, it was a woman chef, they even telling me, Ri, we're going to have a um, convention in D.C. on October. Can you go with me so we can tell the people that there is a legal home back restaurant, you know. There's the movement that can actually helping so many people because I'm an... I mean, I don't have a million dollars or five million dollars to open a restaurant, you know. I'm just an immigrant that come, you know, from Indonesia to here, get married with my husband. But the good thing that I love about it, I still can be home. I'm enjoying having my kids at home, you know. I'm enjoying Sunday is always off for us. Um, uh, Christmas, holidays is off for us because I'm telling everybody, and I'm also become the ambassador for culinary uh, program in San Diego College community because I'm telling them, put it this way, we always work for make somebody else happy, right? We, if we have a restaurant, we want our customer happy. We work in the um, uh, company, we want our boss happy. Then when I'm going to be happy? So having a home-based restaurant with all the legal stuff that you can do, there's a path to do that. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Steve, thank you for your patience, please. Yeah, so I, as most chefs, have opened big, expensive, fancy restaurants and then have them close for whatever reasons. You know, I mean, there's always a million of them. You've all heard that story a thousand times. And so I moved back from L.A. to San Diego, and I was like, okay, my depression's kind of gone now. I'll do one pop-up. At least my friends and my family will come out of sympathy at least and buy tickets to one, right? And so we did, and, um, you know, the pop-up blew up. I mean, Eater wrote about it. It was sold out in minutes, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was this cool thing, <clears throat> and that was just a regular pop-up. It was a tasting menu just with all different kinds of things. And then um, that story coming out, Franz, wherever Franz is at, he, uh, he saw that, and then he reached out to me, and he's like, hey, we have this uh, chef's roll. Can't even remember what it's called, dude. I'm sorry. But it was like the cooking competition at the Caboo. <clears throat> Rockin' Chef, that's what it was called. And long story short, I ended up winning this entire <clears throat> cooking competition, and the sponsored ingredient was Japanese Wagyu. So, of course, once I won, the Japanese guys that were there, some of them I think are here, they wanted to meet me and they're like, you know, I want to meet the guy that won. And I was like, ah, I just have this pop-up. I'm like, what do you guys think about me changing my whole pop-up to all Japanese Wagyu? And they're like, uh, you're fucking crazy, but, you know, okay, fine. You know, they just want to sell Wagyu, right? <laughs> and, at the, and then so then we started this pop-up, <clears throat> but then the thing, that, the thing that's different about this pop-up is that, you know, you sell one or two out in your town and this is 2016 where no one knew anything about Japanese Wagyu. I mean, people know now because after COVID. But 2016, I mean, try, try only on social media selling out 40 tickets for $300 a person. After you get those first few, and I don't have a marketing team. I don't have anything. It's just me, you know. And so, so I said, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take it on the road. It's like, you know, if, if, you know, if Aerosmith or Jay-Z played at Petco Park every day, I'm sure they'd have nights that weren't completely sold out. And not saying I'm them, by the way, but you get what I mean. So I was like, okay, this is a crazy concept. Wagyu tasting menu only. You know, we're doing 16 courses of di each a different prefecture of Japan. I mean, just crazy stuff. And so we're like, okay, let's take it on the road. And then I, you know, I forced myself to learn target marketing and, and all this stuff on like, you know, I'm going to a state that I've never stepped foot in and using somebody's restaurant to host my pop-up and I'm, you know, learning how to do target marketing through Facebook by the right demographics and all of these things, right? And so, 
And so we did that for like five years. And then the pandemic of 2020 came. Literally, we're in the middle of a dinner when we, I got the email saying restaurants were shut down. <clears throat> and then, and I was like, shit. I'm like, this is the last supper, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I'm like, okay, well, what are we going to do the next day? And I told my cooks, that, again, that are all part-time. They all have regular jobs. They just take off when I have a pop-up. And so I told them, I said, hey, you guys each have a job with me starting tomorrow um, for $100, $100 a day, just flat out, you know. And they're like, cool, I'm still on unemployment. You know, I'm probably not supposed to say that, but you know, that's how, that's how it was. It was the wild, wild west. And so I was like, okay, I'm sitting on like 10 grand of Wagyu. Um, I'm going to cut this Wagyu up and, and uh, post it on my Instagram and Facebook because everyone follows me for Wagyu already. Overnight, it exploded. We sold like, we sold like 40 grand overnight on, um, <clears throat> on, you know, Instagram and Facebook through Venmo and PayPal. And I'm like freaking out. Tell my wife, which is back there with my kid, you can hear screaming. And I was like, put it all into a spreadsheet. We're not going to know. Cause someone's Instagram is not the same name as their Venmo or whatever, you know? So, um, and then, so that exploded. We opened all these butcher shops. And then at the same time, what happened was, is we, when we were creating all this trim, this is Japanese Wagyu. This is very expensive. It costs me 50 to $60 a pound. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with this? Okay, let's grind it and make a burger. And, but this would be, this was when there was still complete lockdown. So we're selling ground patties raw. And then we were R and D in our actual cooked burger the whole time. So then the day one that, that they were going to say, okay, restaurants are open again, just for takeout or whatever the hell all those things were. I can't remember, but, and so we were ready and we start, we launched the burger and again, line down the street. It was just crazy, you know, explosion. And then from that point, <clears throat> we, we just kept pivoting into full restaurants and, 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 but that would have butcher shop, burger, tasting menu in the back and all this. And I'm getting to your point is that some things like our tasting menu is not meant to be a brick and mortar because it's too crazy and off the wall. So our Swagu study hall is meant to be a pop-up. That is the business of it. It's not because think about if you open, if I go open a, a, I spend $500,000 and I open Swagu study hall brick and mortar, that's $500 a person because that's what the tickets cost now. $500 a person, you only see 20 a night. You might not be full every night. You might not be. You know, it's an expensive ticket. So, so then what happens is you think, you think because people love your pop-up that you do once a week, you think that, oh, they're going to come every day. Then you end up losing 500 to a million, you know, in, in hoping people are going to come. So fuck that. Oh, sorry, Franz. Um, so you fuck that, right? So it's like be smart and, and you got to understand what, what, what thing, the place that they survive. You know what I mean? And, and don't make a brick and mortar over something that's too crazy. But that doesn't mean don't do it. You know what I'm trying to say? Right. And go ahead. No, it just sounds like what you're describing, which is true of all these <clears throat> business models, right? If yeah. we can even call it that, it's more of a business philosophy or, or a rea- you know, way of doing business that, I mean, you're describing being able to be nimble, right? That seems to me like what you're describing more than anything. You, totally. you haven't signed a 10-year lease. Exactly. You haven't bought a building. You don't have a million people on payroll. You don't have furniture. Which I've done right? and all I've the, lost my ass. Right, yeah. but you don't have all that stuff. Exactly. So you can, I mean, I feel like Robert De Niro in heat. Like, you you know, you spot the heat around the corner. Yeah. You can, like, just well, change everything. How about, how about, I want to always have busy days. You know, think about a restaurant. You know, you're open seven days a week. Oh, yeah, you're, you did so good Friday and Saturday. I'm like, yeah, but the other five days I shit the bed. And then that just took all of the money. So what's the point? What's the point of having slow days? What's up, buddy? Um, so put it this way. I only open Thursday, Friday, Saturday with two time slot, four to six, seven to nine. Since the day we open until next year, I'm fully booked. People come from all over the world now. I have the farthest guests coming from Spain to come to eat. There's guests coming from New York the other day. He, she flew her husband and her come and eat and go back. And then I have 400 people remain in the waiting list just from a small Indonesian restaurant in San Diego, the only one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's a bright future for, for local immigrant in, in San Diego, for me, myself. 
but I still have time to spend time with my kids, go vacation. We just come back from Bali for six weeks. If you own a restaurant... All right, don't rub it in. Don't rub it in. <laughs> These people are working like yes. dogs. All right. Sorry. Uh, Maeve, you look like you have something to say. Oh, I was just going to say that I think that um, the future of business and not necessarily even restaurants is definitely going yeah. to be your ability to adapt and then coupled with your ability to find truly what your one thing is. There's something that each person is just exceptional at. It has nothing to do with education. It has nothing to do where you grew up. You've got something. And if you can find that one something and then you find out how to exploit it while being willing to adapt at all times, I think that that will be the true key to anyone's success, whether you are building an Amazon, building a fortress of AIs and multiple things, or taking over all of Kentucky, that you need to be good at. So when I started Sugar and Scribe, which was a 400 square foot just bakery, I was asked to write a porfoma to get a loan. And at the top parts, based on what I had Googled, even though I went to Boston University and I graduated with honors, all American, I didn't take a class on how to write a business anything. And so I wrote, uh, not go out of business. I mean, I felt like that was a solid, said like, what's your, the top of it said like main goal or something. I said, not go out of business. And I do remember the banker laughing at me. And he was like, ah, oh, and he thought it was so funny. And um, that's what I think of him now because my business is now almost six million a year. So my intention to not go out of business was a great intention. And I probably can't write a you know cohesive grammatical thing, even though I am very much American. Um, but that's okay, because I will find somebody genius like him, and I will go to him, and I will say, I need your help. I would like you to show me how to get a chat, whomever, to do this for me. And I will adapt immediately. And so when the pandemic hit, okay, I'm terrible at budgets, and I'm totally trash at labor. But what I am good at is rallying everyone I know. So I immediately got all the staff together and I literally said, who's in? Like, who's in for whatever rodeo is about to happen? If you're in, stay. If you don't know how you are, you have emotional things, this, this way. And we had half our staff stay and I paid them. And I made my husband go on uh, unemployment. I went on unemployment. I took absolutely every last penny that my mother's you know, retirement had in order to survive it. Um, but we changed everything. We went into shipping with Gold Belly. And Gold Belly was this very, like, small shipping thing at the time. And I remember calling them and being like, I can ship all the following, and I can start tomorrow. I want you to know, I did not know how much a box cost. And they said, send us your things, and I sent it to them. And the very next week, they said, yes, your product meets our standards, Please ship it. And I was like, yes, let's do that. And I literally got off the phone and I was like, has anybody ever purchased bulk shipping boxes? And no. Okay, great. So I went into a UPS and I said, hi, I have no idea what I'm doing. How do I get boxes? And I think like for me, my skill set is that I, I don't care if people think that I am not smart. I don't care if you think I'm anything. All I care about is winning, and I will do anything in order to win. And so I asked everyone, I asked, you know, especially produce, I knew all of them, I called Julia, whatever it is, like, help me figure out, like, how can I do this? How can I do this? And so I'm not alone anymore. Now I have a team. And then I saw other chefs that lost their restaurants or were about to open and didn't. And I said, okay, great. Well, you can come in and you sell out of my place because my current restaurant is massive. I have 4,000 square feet, so let's get to it. And now I have more people in my team. And so I think the more team members you can build, and they don't have to be in your company, they can be in Bali, they can be anywhere, the more teammates you have, and the more people you have with different skill sets, and you adapt together, that will be the future business. Because the reason the McDonald's always survive, the 
the Waffle Houses survive is because of their ability to adapt and change overnight. They have that power. Whereas like the Michelin star places, you're so formatted, you're so pinched in to just adapt and change that rapidly is a struggle. Thank you. Um, I, well, it's funny you brought up Gold Billy because it figures into my next question. This is something for almost everybody here can speak to in some way. Um, you know, I, when I visited friends in the restaurant industry during COVID, I saw the, something I'd never saw before, which was the UPS pile, right? The daily UPS pile. It was Gold Belly. It was all these people who had never been on there. I'm talking two Michelin star restaurants, uh, neighborhood, re I mean, all kinds of people. They had something that was identifiably theirs or that they just did really well. Um, I noticed on your website, Gold Belly's still there as an option. Yeah, it's still um, really big. It still does really well. And it's really funny because um, still to this day, you know, you, you have these things and you get these influxes. And there is this true sense of, like, normalcy in that life will continue when you go from not knowing anything and then all of a sudden you have 200 boxes and you have a guy that was a dishwasher and now he's rolling, you know, ginger chews. And you have somebody who is a server and their job is to make sure that everything is heat sealed so nothing gets in while it's traveling. And so um, it's, again, that amazing adapting. And Gold Belly then had to adapt later. So then it changed again on us because then restaurants are open. Definitely shipping went down. But they didn't give up. They said, okay, so they called me up and will you give a chef class? Can we teach people how to make cookies? And instead of sending them baked cookies, can we send them raw ingredients? And so it just kept like going. And now, our, you know, our biggest gold belly things are corporate. And it's amazing now. You know, we have uh, about 850 custom cookies going out for a corporation. And it's so wild how that has transformed into, you know, me getting on social media, pleading with anyone I know to just buy a chocolate chip cookie so I can pay rent. Um, thank you. Uh, this kind of tie, this ties into this. It's another question that someone asked on the app, but I thought it was a good one. Um, wouldn't have occurred to me to ask it on my own. And that is the cost of using um, third-party fulfillment services, shipping services. Um, the person who posed that question was quoting 25-30% uh, as something. I mean, I know we've heard a lot of uh, complaints over the last several years about um, the kind of gouging that was going on with a lot of the the um, local, you know, food delivery services that would, I don't want to name anybody, that would bring it from the restaurant to your home. You know, that the, 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 the percentage was huge, but, um, you know, Matt... Gold Belly specifically does not work like that at all. No, but where do you see this aspect of the business going? Do you think, um, do you think more businesses are going to take this piece of it on themselves? Do you think that the people who are, for lack of a better word, gouging, uh, are going to have enough competition that it's going to drive that number down and make this a more realistic thing for more food businesses, whether it's a restaurant or whomever, to be able to make more profit, keep more of their profit when they ship something or have something shipped? Why don't you, you want to start? Sure. Um, so we all come to these types of conventions to meet people, learn things, and this one in particular, what I've found is that you're looking for that next new thing or that thing that you might not have heard about that's going to differentiate your restaurant or your company from all the other ones in the area. We always want to present our customers with what we think is the best. Uh, so differentiation is very important. Um, I've been able to do that. You know, we've been doing this for 17 years. Um, it's not that we haven't had our challenges. Uh, delivery of stuff is one of the biggest headaches that we have. Uh, it's not cheap. Um, you know, how do I pass that on? You know, I, I can't pay for everything. Um, there are ways to outsource and people to outsource too. And whereas I, I do outsource a lot of some of the, th uh, I do outsource some of my products, my core products I've kept in house because it speaks more to who I am and what my company is. You know, and what I'm selling to you is that I make this stuff and I want to continue that. So I, I make soy sauce. You know, we make 10,000 gallons a year. 
I will never outsource that. I smoke spices. We smoke 15 different spices. I'll never outsource that. I actually do that for people now. Um, but when it comes to shipping, you know, I looked to outsource that. And it's expensive. And so I did what I usually do when something is a bit more challenging, you know, or doesn't look like I can find somebody to do it the way that I would do it and I learn how to do it better. And so we do all of our own fulfillment um, because it was the most cost effective way for me to do it. Uh, but there are people that will do fulfillment. You know, and it's larger companies, what I've found, um, and it is expensive. I kind of enjoy it. I mean, I, you know, we have a team in the warehouse that handles all of the orders that go out, whether they're pallet, uh, direct to wholesale, uh, retail, mom and pop type places, or we have our old uh, e-commerce fulfillment center. It's adapt and evolve. Um, it, uh, you know, the, the challenge comes from getting is in getting the word out there, and that's why I, I come to places like this. Like I'm, I'm in Kentucky. I'm not a restaurant owner, and I said I was a chef. I cooked. You know, I don't hold a, a, a candle to, to what Rich can do. It's actually offensive, I think, to him for me to call myself a chef. Um, but I did, uh, you know, it's seeing an opportunity, running with it. Um, the challenges are what's fun, you know. I, I, I don't see things as problems. It's like, how am I going to get around this? Am I going to go over it, around it, under it? doesn't really upset me. You know, it is, uh, it's why I'm in business. I didn't have a business background either. I taught myself everything. I didn't know what to be afraid of, which I think helped me move fast. Um, and, you know, I doubt I could run anybody else's company, but I run mine pretty well. Um, and I've always, you know, surrounded myself with people that are, you know, a lot smarter than me, realizing that I can't do everything. Um, that there are people that count things better than me. Uh, there are people that sell things better than me. I'm a pitch man. I cannot close a deal. Um, so I have people that do. Um, it, uh, you know, I don't want to take up everybody's time, but I don't think it's that important to be the smartest one. You know, you don't lead that way. Um, I love what you're doing. I mean, I, I love what I hear everybody saying, but I think that this is kind of, it's almost like it's illegal. And everybody wants it's that. Legal. It's legal. I, I get that it's legal, it's but legal. it's like a speakeasy. I want to do one when I get home. You know, one, one thing I think that, first of all, it is, it's inspiring to hear what everyone has done. But a lot of times, whenever we're looking and, and considering different sales channels and different models, it's probably a symptom of a, of a broader challenge within our industry. And that is the fact that the cost of doing business is has risen to the point where we're getting to a tipping point where it's really not sustainable. So I think it's on us, everybody here, and as you can see, these are good examples of people that are trying to do that, is that we have to disrupt the model without disrupting our business. Because the restaurant industry uh, is so labor intensive that uh, you, all the different things that I do, I mean, I've done them because I wanted to develop different sales channels. And in some cases, uh, yes, selling stuff on Amazon is a very aggressive percentage. It eats into your margin, but it gives you access to 500 million people that I otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, wouldn't have. And, and I love, you know, uh, talking about having, you know, the dishwasher multitasking uh, and building boxes that are going out the door. You, you didn't have to hire somebody else in uh, just to be able to fulfill an order that's going out of another sales channel. Um, my route, even though I, you know, I have restaurants, and I did have a fine dining restaurant uh, several years ago, lost money in that, uh, and I think you really learn about money when you lose money. Um, and it made me a sharper business person. I learned a lot from that. But I've always put a lot of my energy into thinking about embracing technology and equipment and these different sales platforms because I think about my time every day is it's like a dollar bill and I have an equity of time that I'm going to spend. And I try to spend it on the things that are going to be most impactful. And if 
different technology or different equipment is going to give me some of my time back so that I can spend it in more meaningful places. And sometimes that's spending more team, time with my team or my family. Uh, you know, all of, I like to focus on building models uh, and brands and then put them into place where I'm still involved, but maybe I'm not involved in the same capacity as I was at maybe a different phase of the runway in my career. Uh, all of our ovens that we use have actually pictures of what you're cooking. Uh, and people, you know, a lot of the kids, they're, I mean, they're not kids, but they're young. Uh, in my heist, they're almost kids. But some of these people, it's like their first job they've ever had. And they're smoking brisket and, you know, doing sous vide short ribs, re-therming and stuff like that. And it's pretty cool. We opened up um, a new restaurant in Atlanta, and it is a fully electric uh you know, no hood, no exhaust, uh, fully electric kitchen. And I can tell you right there, that's a different angle. I mean, if you look at the expenditures of opening up a restaurant and going in and putting in the traditional model, you're going to spend a lot more money. So I think we all have to consider everything. As intimidating as it may be, it's essential because, you know, you mentioned the, the movie uh, Heat. I think of... Uh, no country for old men, and the old man at the end says, you know, you can't stop what's coming. Uh, you know, we ain't all waiting around for you. That's vanity. And it's true. You know, you, you, if you don't embrace a lot of these different options, uh, there's a danger you can be at a competitive disadvantage. And I think we all need to learn from each other and look forward. Rhi, I see you want to talk. I'm really sorry. I have to go to questions from the audience because we're down to just a few minutes. Um, by the way, how dark is this panel? Heat and no country for old men. Um, I can't see. Does anyone have a question out there? If you do, holler because I'm not seeing a hand. Yeah. Hang on. Let me let me come over with the mic. Hold on. My robot will do this next year. Hold on. <laughs> Uh, obviously, with the discussion of AI and the chat GPT and all that stuff, um, is there anything on any of your radars that you think might be one of the next big things that we're going to have to look at three, four, five years from now when it might be something that comes to fruition and makes big waves in the industry? I mean, certainly, I think that cookbooks and, you know, people always, at least in, in the cake world, it's a... Uh, you know, whose design was it? And um, I'm sure it can play out to other things. But for example, um, people that are, and I'm not saying I'm super, super awesome, but people when you get to my level of cakes where we're charging thousand plus for certain cakes, um, we know all the other people who are charging those and we know where they are everywhere. And we always make sure that we give credit to that. You know, this was Steve's cake. This was Bob's cake. You know, loved recreating, you know, Sylvia Weinstock's cake. Loved recreating Ron Ben Israel's cake. And so I think with that IA, AI coming in, I think it'll be more challenging. And um, cookbooks have certainly really come back. Hardcore, full force. People are learning now. They're learning online. And so I think that we will start seeing more of that. And you'll wonder, um, is it authentic? Did they really do that? Or, or is it something that, it's still authentic. It's weird. I think actually AI is authentic. It's just a different type of authentic. Well, and, and also equal to that is a component of AI uh, involved in that. You're going to see uh, the drone delivery space is going to accelerate. Uh, one of the, the leading uh, R&D companies for drones just moved to Northern Virginia. And it's a lot of uh, several ex-military people that opened that up. And they did that because of the proximity to Washington, D.C., where a lot of the lobbyists and legislators can expedite some of the approvals because you can't just have a drone and fly it over and start doing deliveries. Uh, so you should, you're smart to be uh, looking at these technologies because they're, they're definitely going to have an impact uh, in a lot sooner than later. In terms of uh, AI being authentic, it just reminded me of a line. The, the, the comedian George Burns had this line, the most important thing in life is authenticity. If you can fake that, you've got it made. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> um, we, okay, let's go to Re and then Matt, and then we're up against our um, end time, and there's other panels, so I'm going to have to leave it there, but please. I just want to add in this way. 
Um, I'm so grateful and I'm so glad that now we, I am especially working in the hospitality industry. Everybody that I meet here being so nice. And then I grew up in the culture of family is always important. I grew up in, you know, being nice to the neighbor, being nice to your community. So I think whatever we are going, whatever the future of the business is, if you, if you put your love into it, there will be a way to do it. Uh, you know, for companies like mine where we're a manufacturer and we're buying a lot of raw materials, um, I think the future is a lot about transparency and, you know, showing where our stuff comes from. That's always been important to me. I'm finding that it's becoming more and more important to our customers that they want to know that, you know, where, say, my paprika comes from or who I'm buying soybeans from, how they're growing it. It's important. And then to, to do good. You know, I think people appreciate that, whether we're doing good for, for uh, you know, humankind, our, our community, or our world with the way things are grown and doing it in a respectful, you know, um, a way that just doesn't destroy everything. You know, as we grow, we are looking to buy a farm, um, you know, and regenerative agriculture. Uh, I want to grow my own stuff. I'm not a farmer. But I want to do it. I'll find somebody. Uh, perfect last word. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking this panel. And enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you.